Uh, welcome to the after lunch uh, part of the uh, plenary session devoted to Nitrina. And uh, the, the next talk uh, in, in this part is uh, the talk by Dmitry Zaborov, High Energy Neutrino Astronomy and the Baikal GVD Neutrino Telescope. Please, uh, 25 minutes and uh, after 20 uh, after 20 minutes, I let you know about five right. minutes left. Right. So uh, let me know if you can hear me well. Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. Begin. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Then um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank the organizer for the opportunity to present this talk. Uh, the talk is uh, uh, of two parts. Uh, first is an um, introduction uh, to the neutrino astronomy. If you didn't attend uh, yesterday's neutrino session that may be useful or simply if you're not familiar with the field. Um, and the second part is a status report on the Baikal GVD experiment. Uh, so uh, why use uh, neutrinos for astronomy? Uh, there are actually uh, many reasons for that. Um, Neutrinos can escape uh, from dense environments that are opaque to uh, gamma rays or other uh, wavelengths of photons. Uh, neutrinos can uh, traverse gas and dust. Uh, it doesn't interact with uh, CMB or infrared background. It is stable, or at least we, we think it is stable, and it's not affected by uh, magnetic deflection. And finally, it's a, a good messenger for studying uh, non-thermal processes, such as those related to cosmic ray acceleration and uh, production and acceleration. Uh, so in, in this talk, we are dealing with, uh, with energy range from about 10 GeV and, uh, and up. Uh, this is what we understand by neutrino telescope is something working in this energy range. In this range, uh, we are mainly dealing with atmospheric neutrinos and astrophysical neutrinos, uh, which, uh, which is a main topic uh, for, for surges. Uh, so how, how does um, a neutrino telescope work? Uh, traditionally, we are using Cherenkov technology uh, so a neutrino hits a nuclei somewhere in the detector or in front of the detector. Uh, this produces secondary particles which produce Cherenkov light and we detect this Cherenkov light with uh, photomultiplier tubes. And this of course needs to be done in transparent medium. And because we need a very large size, something like a cubic kilometer, we uh, can only use uh, naturally existing site. Uh, this is usually uh, clean water or clean ice. So light produces heats in the PMTs and you use these heats to reconstruct the event for from heat positions and times to reconstruct the direction and from the charge, how much light you see, you reconstruct the energy. Uh, this technique is sensitive to uh, neutral current and charge current uh, processes by all neutrino flavors in case you, uh, you have a muon neutrino interacting through charge current, uh, you get a long muon track, usually a few hundred meters or a few kilometers long. So this, uh, this is a, an event topology, which we call a track. Uh, and all other events, they are uh, usually referred to as showers or cascades. Uh, so in the search for uh, astrophysical neutrino, we have to deal with backgrounds, uh, particular from atmospheric neutrinos. Atmospheric neutrino background is a four pi background and uh, it's almost irreducible. Also, there are some, some methods to, to get rid of this, uh, thanks to the fact that neutrino comes, uh, if you are looking for neutrino from above, then uh, it's uh, sometimes accompanied with, a, with an atmospheric muon bundle because they actually come from the same uh, initial interaction of the primary cosmic ray. So 
this can be used to veto atmospheric neutrinos. Um, but normally this is a rather difficult to reduce background. Uh, then we have to deal with atmospheric muons or muon bundles. Uh, these can only come from above because they cannot traverse uh, the Earth. So you can get rid of them by uh, reconstructing the track and making a cut on the zenith angle. And of course, you have you can have uh, some environmental background light, which can also sp spoil somewhat your or experience with measuring these, these events and limit your low energy sensitivity. Uh, currently, uh, there are four neutrino telescopes operating in this energy range around the world. Uh, first is uh, Ice Cube, uh, which was completed in 2010. Uh, it's about a cubic kilometer uh, size. Uh, there are some plans to extend it to larger size uh, using uh, optic and also radio methods. Um, then in the Mediterranean Sea, there is Antares, uh, which is actually a previous generation experiment relative to Ice Cube, but it's still operating. Uh, it's uh, at least 50 times smaller than Ice Cube, and it, it was uh, optimized for lower energies. Uh, then there is KM3Net, uh, which is in fact two detectors. The one uh, of interest for astrophysics uh, primarily is uh, is called ARCA, and it's about it's going to be about one uh, cubic kilometer, similar to Ice Cube, and it's now under construction. Uh, so these are these use uh, seawater, uh, and there is also Baikal GVD, which will be the main. Uh, part, uh, the, the second part of my talk. It's going to be also a cubic kilometer big and it's half complete and I'll give you more details in this talk. Uh, so Ice Cube is, uh, as I said, is a cubic kilometer uh, detector. Uh, it consists of uh, about 5,000 uh, optical modules uh, installed at uh, depths between uh, 1,500 and 2,500 meters in the ice, in transparent Antarctic ice. Uh, besides the main uh, array, there is also a um, so-called deep core, which is an additional dense core for mainly for um, neutrino oscillation studies. And there is also a, a air shower detector on top of the ice. Uh, the detector was completed in 2010 and produced uh, already many uh, publications, discoveries, uh, and so on. Um, the energy uh, threshold for the detectors is about 100 GeV for the main array, and it counts about 200 atmospheric neutrinos per day. So most results uh, that exist in this field, um, they come from ice cubes so far. Uh, so Antares, as I said, is a previous generation, and uh, it has uh, less than 1,000 optical modules. Uh, has been in operation for 12 years, uh, producing also many publications, unfortunately only upper limits uh, on sources. Uh, so these had 12 strings, 25 stories per string, and so three optical modules per story. Uh, each module had a excuse me have a 10 inch uh, Hamamatsu PMT inside, and uh, this is still in operation. Came uh, net Arca will replace Antares uh, when it is finally constructed. Now, now it's only uh, the first stages of its construction. There is a couple of uh, uh, strings which already uh, deploy and working. Uh, it is located 100 kilometers offshore uh, Sicily, uh, in Italy, at the depth of 3,400 meters. Uh, it will be uh, two blocks of 115 vertical strings each, with 18 uh, digital optical modules on each string. And uh, uh, this optical module is a bit special because it has, instead of one big photomultiplier, it has 31 small photomultiplier. 
and this provides some advantages. Uh, this module is uh, much more sensitive than a traditional module, uh, almost three times. So it basically replaces three optical modules of Antares just with one uh, such module. Um, it provides directional information about the direction from which the photon uh, arrives. So this helps with the reconstruction of events. Uh, and it's, it's fully digital, and it also provides better counting of photons, and which helps with energy resolution. Uh, vertical spacing between optical modules is 36 meters. Not nine meters here is a, is a typo. So 36 meters vertical spacing and 90 meters between strings. And uh, as I said, this is under construction as the first stages of construction. So now let's uh, go through some results, mainly by IceCube. On this slide, you can see the um, uh, picture from a recent publication about the diffuse flux of ne astrophysical neutrinos. Uh, here um, in uh, black, you can see the data. Uh, then the field histograms uh, are for the background, uh, mainly from atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, and uh, as you see, uh, the measured um, uh, neutrino spectrum uh, is uh, higher than, uh, than the background at high energies. And this is now interpreted as a presence of uh, astrophysical diffuse neutrino flux, which is fitted here uh, and is shown by a red uh, curve. So as you see, uh, at energies above uh, 20 TV or so, uh, this astrophysical flux actually dominates uh, over the atmospheric uh, background, at least uh, in this cascade analysis, the uh, situation is a bit different in the track analysis, but here with cascades, uh, basically you, you are completely dominated by astrophysical flux at above certain energy, and at energies of about 100 TeV and above, basically uh, almost every event is uh, astrophysical. So this is now a well-established uh, flux. Uh, it, uh, the uh, individual events in this flux uh, come from uh, all over the sky. There is uh, no real clustering of events. Therefore, um, uh, only upper limits uh, are set on individual sources. Uh, but before we go to point sources, here are some more pictures about the diffuse flux. Here on the left is shown a, a plot showing two different measurements of the, of the diffuse flux and using two different analyses. Uh, HESE is a high energy uh, starting event. Uh, this is mainly cascade uh, events uh, starting inside the detector. Uh, and uh, uh, this is in purple and in red is um, track analysis, mainly sensitive to muon neutrino. So you see they give slightly different uh, fluxes and uh, spectral indices, but uh, overall are quite uh, reasonably consistent with each other. So there are many measurements like this with different uh, types of analysis. Uh, uh, there's also an analysis by Antares. Unfortunately, because Antares is so small, it only observes uh, diffuse flux at uh, less than two sigma statistical significance. Uh, nevertheless, they can fit this excess uh, uh, with a spectral model. And this is shown in red uh, on the right plot. And uh, this is consistent with the ice cube result. Uh, so as I said, um, there's no clustering on the sky uh, for these uh, events, or at least no obvious clustering. Uh, so only upper limits uh, exist on, on individual sources. Uh, here on this slide uh, shown is a uh, upper limit plot uh, for, um, uh, for a list of candidate sources. Uh, these are black points or red points. Uh, black points are for uh, for an assumption of e to minus three spectrum, and red is for an assumption of e to minus two spectrum. And um, 
these are is shown is as function of declination of the x-axis. Uh, as you see, ice cube is mainly sensitive to the sources in the northern sky, and so uh, in the the south, south uh, southern sky is uh, much less covered by ice cube, and this is where uh, additional neutrino telescopes are necessary, such as Antares or KM3 Net and Baikal. Uh, you, you can see here also the Antares sensitivity curves, which are shown in, in black. And uh, you see even Antares, even though it's 100 times, almost 100 times smaller than Ice Cube, for some assumption of the uh, spectrum, it's actually compatible in sensitivity to Ice Cube in this uh, uh, northern sky. Sorry, sorry, southern sky. Uh, so here only four point, four uh, candidate sources appear a bit uh, special. Some some excesses. Uh, the combined excess is slightly above three sigma, which is rather interesting. So this is an evidence of some non-uniformity. Uh, but no, none of these sources is above three sigma individually. Uh, the strongest source is actually a galaxy, um, an active galaxy of, I think, a non-blazer type, MGC 1068. Uh, anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting candidate. Uh, uh, then there are also the multi-messenger studies where, where you look uh, not only at the clustering on the sky, but also temporal coincidence or, or, or coincidence in space uh, on the sky with some uh, event or object in seen in other wavelengths, like uh, in gamma rays or other other wavelengths. And uh, so this is an event uh, which uh, is historic for, for the neutrino astronomy. Uh, it's a neutrino or with a, a track-like uh, neutrino uh, with an energy of nearly 300 TV. Uh, and this was observed in September 2017 by Ice Cube. Uh, an alert about this event was sent to uh, many telescopes. Many telescopes have followed it. And uh, actually, uh, uh, a coincidence or you know, some, some flaring event, so roughly coincidence with this event, uh, was observed by Fermi in the GV band and by MAGIC uh, at energies above 100 GV. Uh, these are high energy or very, very high energy gamma rays. And uh, this, um, uh, is, this is observed as the location of TXS0546, which is an active galaxy. So from, from here, uh, it was concluded that there is probably some uh, association between this neutrino event and, and this, uh, this flare of this particular source. Uh, th this coincidence could, in principle, be accidental. But then when Ice Cube uh, looked at the uh, uh, historic light curve of this uh, uh, source, they actually found, uh, found an almost four, four sigma excess in, uh, in the data from 2015. And, and so when taking together this fact of coincident observation of a gamma ray flare and also this 3.7 sigma excess, uh, this actually looks like a, quite a convincing uh, source of high energy neutrinos. And of course, uh, there are some spectral fit, which is shown on the left uh, bottom here, uh, trying to uh, estimate what the, what the spectral index and flux of this source is, and, and then uh, what the location of this source. Uh, and it's, as I said, it's uh, uh, consistent with the location of this uh, AGN. Uh, now let's get to Baikal. Uh, here is a, a picture of how how the Baikal gigaton volume detector or GVD uh, is planned to look. Uh, it consists of many clusters. Each cluster is an independent, basically an independent uh, neutrino detector, and then you collect the data from these clusters uh, on shore and. Uh, search for your neutrinos. Uh, currently, it's a collaboration of uh, 10 institutes from five countries. countries uh, uh, about uh, 70 collaboration members. Uh, it's actually a very small collaboration compared to IceCube or Kames3Net. 
Um, so, um, um, so sometimes we have to take compromises uh, where to put our, our manpower. And so far, the, our main priority has been the construction of the telescope. Um, here is a site of Baikal GVD. Uh, it's located at Lake Baikal, just uh, nearly four kilometers away from shore. Uh, at this location, the uh, lake bed is very flat uh, with only a couple of meters, plus minus a couple of meters uh, deviations from flatness. Uh, the water is transparent to 22 meters in absorption and even longer for scattering. Uh, we, and uh, in winter, there's a ice cover or nearly one meter uh, thick uh, ice uh, on which you can drive and put your equipment, which is very convenient for uh, the deployment of this, uh, of this installation. Uh, excuse me, Dmitry, you have uh, five minutes, please speed up. Yeah, okay. So, um, so here is how this uh, Baikal GVD looks. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the cluster has uh, eight strings, and each string has uh, 36 optical modules. Uh, the optical module uh, includes a 10-inch Hamamatsu photomultiplier tube and, and some calibration equipment like LED. Additionally, you have uh, LED uh, beacons uh, located along the strings. Uh, also, uh, some laser beacons, just a few for the whole array. And uh, these beacons can illuminate basically uh, the whole cluster. And with several beacons, you can illuminate the whole detector, uh, somehow mimicking the um, uh, high energy neutrinos. And we also have uh, hydrophones for acoustic positioning. Uh, this provides calibration of timing calibration of two nanosecond accuracy and uh, 20 centimeter precision for uh, positioning. Uh, in spite of harsh uh, uh, condition, weather condition, ice conditions, uh, uh, we managed to deploy actually the two new clusters uh, last winter. And so currently we have seven clusters and uh, the combined uh, volume uh, occupied by these clusters is about one third of the cubic kilometer. Uh, so far we are moving uh, through this deployment schedule just uh, just as planned and we plan to build at least uh, 15 clusters uh, so at least uh, eight more to go uh, some first results from the track analysis uh, currently we, we have just a simple uh, track fit with a chi-square like function uh, likelihood fit is in, still in development from this simple fast fit, uh, we get uh, uh, distribution of events like shown here on the right. This is uh, b before any cut on the zenith angle or, or any even some quality cuts. Uh, you can see that we can uh, roughly uh, reproduce uh, uh, the data with our Monte Carlo. So th this is good. And then on the left bottom plot, you can see how we um, uh, select our neutrinos in this analysis. So we make a cut on the zenith angle, selecting only upgoing events, and then on the fit quality, and then we get a very clean neutrino sample, apparently. At least this is what we expect from Monte Carlo, and indeed, uh, uh, we see that uh, once you do all these cuts, we observe uh, 57 events, uh, while expected is 40, 54 events. Uh, this is what's shown here is a data from 2019 with 300 uh, days of single uh, cluster lifetime. This is a single cluster analysis. The combination of data from different cluster uh, clusters is still uh, in preparation, uh, has not been released yet for public. 
So, uh, but at least at this point, uh, it looks like we can uh, observe atmospheric neutrinos and uh, get rid of the atmospheric muon background and uh, everything looks like predicted by Monte Carlo. Here are some candidate events from, uh, from this analysis. Uh, typically you have uh, two uh, strings on the cluster here. These are actually four separate events each seen on each, its own cluster, and this is how they look. Uh, you can see uh, the color shows uh, the time uh, from red to blue is uh, from early to, to late. Uh, you can see that these events come from below. Uh, for, for the cascade analysis, uh, we expect, uh, as I said, a uh, effective volume of about one third cubic kilometer. Uh, with a threshold of about a uh, few TV uh, for this analysis uh, of cascades. And uh, the majority of events are uh, around uh, 30 TV from, uh, from atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, basically the median uh, energy is probably about 30 TV. And from uh, astrophysics, uh, uh, we expect to be able to see astrophysics above uh, 50 TeV or so, uh, that astrophysics should dominate. And uh, at above 100 TeV, mostly we should see astrophysics uh, neutrinos. And in total, we expect about uh, four, four events per year for, for a seven cluster uh, detector uh, from astrophysics. So here's some details on the analysis. I think we, I don't have the time to go through through the details, uh, but uh, what, uh, what's uh, the message here is that uh, we are looking for these events and these tight enough cut on the energy. Uh, and on a, also if you select uh, zenith angle not affected by the background, uh, here, here we don't have a good estimate for the background yet. So it's not shown here. Uh, any, anyway, uh, we, we can see some, some of the events which look like uh, they should be astrophysical origin, particularly uh, one upgoing event, it's energy uh, of about 91 TeV. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, the angular resolution in this analysis is expected to be about three degree. So here is an example of this, uh, of this event display of this, uh, uh, event, uh, which is so far our best candidate uh, for an astrophysical neutrino. Uh, it has a 91 degree, um, 91 TV energy, uh, placing it in the energy range dominated by astrophysical neutrinos. Uh, it is, uh, it happened, uh, the vertex, uh, the interaction happened inside the GVD cluster, which makes a reconstruction highly reliable and excludes uh, the atmospheric uh, muon origin or any other uh, background origin. And uh, the zenith angle is about 19 degree from below horizon, which is also perfectly good angle for astrophysical neutrino of this energy. So this uh, is likely an astrophysical neutrino from the diffuse flux. And this brings me to my conclusion. Um, so uh, many the discoveries uh, already uh, were made in this field, in particular the diffuse neutrino flux seen by ice cube and the TXS05 or seen by ice cube. Now this needs to be complemented by uh, detectors in the Northern hemisphere. And currently Baikal GVD is the largest neutrino telescope in the Northern hemisphere and it starts, started to deliver data uh, with atmospheric neutrinos reliably seen and also some first astrophysical neutrino candidates uh, available. Thank you for your attention.